So um, welcome to the Investor Water Hub Speaker Series for the month of January. And uh, as you can hear, this is very much a, a team effort of, of the Series Investor Water team. And uh, my colleague Hugh and I um, uh, jumping in here to moderate and kick off a, what we hope is a very exciting and helpful topic uh, to investors who really are interested in the idea of leveraging big data and AI, uh, aka artificial intelligence for better ESG, environmental social governance, and water risk analysis. So before I turn it over to our very exciting speakers, uh, just a couple housekeeping I um, issues. Please do ask questions or if, if questions um, arise during the presentation, please do type them into the chat box on the left. and. During set times in the webinar, we will uh, be asking those questions of our speakers on behalf uh, of you all. And for whatever questions we don't get to, we'll certainly endeavor to try to get them answered for you afterward as well. So we will be recording and sharing also the presentation um, for any colleagues that uh, have missed or were not able to join us. Um, and so just as a reminder for those of you who have not joined one of our speaker series in the past, uh, this is a as a monthly uh, activity that we host as uh, the Investor Water Hub, which is a working group of over 100 um, institutional investors working with series um, on uh, raising water awareness and uh, deepening their water integration and engagement practices. And as part of um, the deep dive that we're doing today on metrics and tools, um, just a reminder that in the Investor Water Toolkit website and also the, the PDF, we do have a chapter very much doing a deep dive on all the many different excellent third-party tools and data sets that are out there. Um, so just uh, also a quick reminder that we do have some uh, upcoming uh, opportunities for investors. We do have two smaller working groups underway around TCFD and physical water risk analysis and also uh, portfolio water footprinting. So if anyone has interest in those topics, feel free to reach out to uh, myself or anyone on the series uh, Investor Water team. Um, and also we do have, um, there is an investor sign-on opportunity underway this week uh, around uh, water and climate risks in meat sourcing and for fast food company supply chain. So please do reach out to Robin Miller at miller at series.org for more information, but the deadline's coming up this Friday, so tomorrow. Um, but without further ado, I'm really excited, and um, we've had this topic, uh, and these speakers lined up for a while because we were so excited to um, have them come on board. Uh, so before we, we start with Dr. Ashby Monk, um, I want to uh, introduce um, two speakers, uh, Dr. Toby Messier and Stephen Fautier from Aquantix. And Aquantix um, comes from uh, and based out of Montreal. And first, I just want to give a shout out to, to Montreal. Uh, we do travel then, uh, there often and feel there is so much interesting, innovative things happening on the sustainable investing front in Montreal, um, you know, very much with the leadership of the Case Depot Quebec, but also a number of other um, foundations, um, universities, endowments, and um, and uh, group activities. There's the Finance and Sustainability Initiative, which is driving a lot of really interesting evolution and investment practices. Um, there's also McGill doing good work, Concordia uh, District 3, which is sort of an innovation incubator, um, and also the, uh, the Center for Sustainable Enterprises at Concordia as well, among many, many other things. So if, if you do have any interest in sustainable practices and enterprises and ESG integration, uh, Montreal is a real hotbed of, of interesting developments and, and ideas. Um, so as part of that, Aquantix based out of Montreal um, is doing some really interesting work in trying to bring um, water risk management and le leveraging uh, you know, interesting data generation algorithms and AI um, to, to bring innovation to investors on water risk uh, research. And Stephen Fortier um, is an engineering graduate, uh, path, uh, passionate about mathematics, AI, and innovation. We also have um, joining the Aquantix presentation Dr. Toby Messier. He's uh, co-CEO with Stephen uh, of Aquantix. And uh, in addition to 
um, being very much interested in um, tech and innovation, both uh, on the investor side, but also on the medical and education side. Um, he is also a practicing medical doctor at uh, McGill, so certainly a, a busy, busy person. Um, but uh, before we join Aquantix, we're really excited to have Dr. Ashby Monk from Stanford uh, University. Uh, Dr. Monk is the executive director of Stanford University's Global, Global Project Center and also co-founder and chairman of uh, The Long Game, a company that seeks to use short-term incentives um, to really try to drive better and more constructive savings and investment behaviors. Um, he also is an expert and works with many um, uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds around their uh, governance and, and structural design. Um, and in addition to being a thought leader um, on alternative data and, and uh, AI and innovation in, in data as well. So uh, lots of exciting work um, that uh, Dr. Monk is doing and we're delighted to have him come and, and speak uh, now um, on rethinking alternative data in uh, institutional investment. Uh, Ashby? Great. Yeah, I'm here. Um, thanks for thanks for having me, and, and thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, it's uh, I have to say it's fun to be doing this this morning here. Um, we've had what well, must be three or four inches of rain in the last 48 hours, and I'm I'm looking out at rain as as I as I launch into this presentation at 7 a.m. here in uh, in California. But um, look, I think the work that we do at Stanford, which is uh, a big chunk of, of the research that I do in my life, um, is focused on helping long-term investors kind of live up to that moniker, long-term, um, helping them achieve higher, higher returns through uh, better governance, uh, through better operations and systems. And, and we write a lot about that, and we study that. And, and one of the the big projects that we've been focused on over the last three years, I would describe as the technology of institutional investment. If you, um, if you kind of simplify the model of institutional investment down to its component parts, I think you'll find that almost every investor on earth um, really does three things. Uh, they take a pool of capital. Uh, to that capital, they add people, process, and information. Um, and they combine the capital, the people, the process, and information in order to generate a return, as in more capital. The people, the process, and the information are the inputs in the production function. And they can be cultivated internally, like they are in Canada, to a pension plan. They can be cultivated externally, like we often see uh, with endowments, or they can be blended. And, uh, and so the work that I do tends to focus on how do we get better people, how do we improve process, and how do we get better information into these organizations to make investment decisions that maximize return, um, squeeze every uh, unit of return out of the risk being, being taken by the investment organization. In order to improve that production function, our research tells us that there's really only three levers you can pull on and that is governance, culture, and technology. So you can seek to change the makeup of the board of directors of your investment organization. You can seek to change the culture, which implies you know, a risk-taking culture, a knowledge-sharing culture, so on and so forth, or you can change the technology. So uh, in our experience, technology is the easiest, the easiest of the three to try to solve. The governance often requires uh, an act of a legislature or a, a change of the nomination procedures to a board of directors or a shift in a delegation authority. And culture can take decades. You can destroy culture in the matter of a year, but it can take decades to build a successful culture. And so the reason I give that long-winded introduction is to sort of explain why we have spent so much time and effort understanding the data, and in particular the alternative data, because ultimately if we want to help the pension funds, the sovereign funds, the endowments, the foundations in the world achieve their long-term objectives, we probably really need to focus on their technology with the idea that through technology we can improve their people, their process, and their information. So that's the, now we're all sort of on the rails here. Um, improving the information obviously is a big part of that production function and that kind of takes us into the alternative data component 
although alternative data has many value propositions, which I'll jump into in this presentation. Um, not only can it obviously improve the information you're using to make investment decisions, but it can also um, help you change processes, and it can also empower people to do new things in new ways. So uh, jumping in, alternative data for those that don't have a background in this space is really just innovative data. In, in the world of finance, we tend to use that word alternative often uh, when what we need is innovative. You know, the, the, uh, the notion of, of, um, of alternative assets, you know, these are really just innovative assets that don't fit into the mainstream portfolios. And, and the same kind of idea goes with alternative data sets. It's innovative data that are not conventionally used for investment decision making. And so when we sort of talk about it in, in the research center or with some of the pension funds and sovereign funds I work with, it's just unique and proprietary data in some cases, or it's just innovative data that others aren't using. And the classic example, which I'm sure most people here have heard about, is hedge funds counting cars in, in retail parking lots. So paying somebody to sit in a retail lot with a, a little clicker, having that person there every single day, and then extrapolating from that data some prediction about a retailer's uh, future earnings. These are the types of things that kind of uh, jump into people's mind when you, when you mention alternative data. And uh, it can come out of satellite imagery, you know, pointing a satellite down at a piece of infrastructure to, to track its development and construction. Um, in the old days, we used to have to explain why a tweet storm could be alternative data. Today, we have a president that, that definitely uses tweet storms to affect um, you know, the news cycle and, and has an effect on public markets. So understanding the effect of social media on markets is, is increasingly important. And then there's many different ways in which um, what we call data exhaust has an effect on, on markets. And or at least an ability to help you understand markets. Um, and by that I mean, as an example, watching LinkedIn and, and tracking people moving from certain companies and, and going to other companies is, a, is an interesting and innovative way to understand whether or not that company is exciting and attractive to uh, potential employees and people are moving there or if it's kind of the, the place everybody's leaving. And that type of a platform, LinkedIn, it may not have been set up as a as a signal generating platform for investors, but the very fact that we're all using it and relying on it is driving many people to actually now see things like that as signals unto themselves. And so we're seeing a lot of interest in, in alternative data among the organizations I work with. Um, in my view, alternative data is one of the most important innovations uh, taking place today. Probably as important or more important than alternative than, than artificial intelligence. Um, if you think of what AI can do and will do in the future, it, it really will only realize its full potential with the injection of alternative data. So unleashing alternative um, forms of intelligence on the same tortured data sets that many of us are using in, in the financial services world will struggle to, to deliver much of any insight beyond you know, small incremental changes and abilities to generate alpha. Whereas if you combine artificial intelligence with alternative data, or you use alter artificial intelligence to create new alternative data, that's where step changes can occur in risk management, alpha generation, uh, understanding of physical assets, due diligence, and, and so on and so forth. And so we're seeing all these investors around the world taking it seriously in part because we have this massive digitization of the built environment that's going on today, um, which is leading to countless sensors being injected into, you know, um, the ground, strapped around your wrist, uh, floating above you in a drone, um, tracking your every movement, and all of that is allowing us to better understand the real economy. And the, it's a very easy step to go from using all that data to understand the real economy to using that data to make smarter and better investment decisions. So um, this is nothing new. Uh, alternative data has been around for 4,000 years. Uh, I sometimes joke um, 
you know, our, our grandparents called organic food um, food, and alternative data is, uh, is pretty similar. This just used to be data. It only became alternative when we de defined very conventionally the data that we regulate and oversee and utilize in, uh, in investment decisions. But in general, alternative data has been around since Babylonian times. The Babylonians quite famously used to track the depth and flow of the Euphrates River um, as, a, as a signal of where the rains were falling and what crop yields could be for six commodities. And so they could correlate depth and flow of Euphrates with uh, commodity prices, and that would give them an early signal of which crops they should stock up now and which crops they could get for cheap later. And, you know, 4,000 years later, um, to me, that looks and feels a lot like an Excel spreadsheet, which gives you an indication of how much um, our technology is kind of stuck in the past. Uh, but that's starting to change with some of the inferential tools that are coming out of alternative data and artificial intelligence. Another famous example, Alan Greenspan's briefcase was really big when I was in college. Um, you know, if he was walking to uh, a Federal Reserve meeting with a briefcase that had papers sticking out of the top and it was stuffed full, you knew there was some change that was going to be made and markets would react accordingly. If he had a clean and uh, a neat briefcase, you could assume that there was going to be no change. And, and people actually relied on that one. That was a, a real signal for people, um, obviously short-term signal. And, um, and, and that's part of the challenge of alternative data is many people view this almost in, in the same vein as foreknowledge, as in this is knowledge that just allows us to briefly predict the future and, and capture a rent. But, but that's not exactly true about much of the alternative data. If you kind of follow through with the um, definition I presented you earlier, that it's just innovative data that isn't conventionally used, there's an argument we can make that most of the ESG data in the world today sits in that camp of alternative data. Um, and that this notion of alternative data as it's increasing in popularity is a um, opportunity for those of us that really do want to bring ESG into the fold of the mainstream Alternative data represents an opportunity to do that. We can use this moment and the popularity of this data and the signals coming out of the built environment to um, create processes and governance for investors to begin to take this data more seriously in their logic, which can only help us um, kind of bring into the investment decision all the ESG data that I think is probably of, of incredible interest to everybody on the, on the line. Um, specifically around water, I know we're supposed to be focused on water. Um, this is an area actually where all data is maturing. I can think of a few companies, I think we're going to hear from one after me, that are working in this space of all data and focused on water. Um, and we're tracking water. We, we already create a lot of um, alternative data sets, uh, listing some of them here. And there, there is an opportunity now for investors to begin to utilize that data to make predictions. Uh, obviously, when we were here in the drought a few years ago, boy, we're nowhere near that today uh, with all the rain we're having. But um, we saw a lot of people pointing to these types of alternative data sets as they were justifying investment decisions. Um, you know, the, the one that jumps to mind in particular is almond orchards and uh, you know, the, the serious risks of owning those types of assets in a drought-ridden environment. And the number of times I heard that sentence um, uttered by a chief investment officer was something entirely new. And, and that, in my mind, is uh, incredibly constructive. So um, we are entering a new phase of popularity for alternative data, um, and, and there's good reason for that. Uh, I'll list some of them off. I, I think the first and obvious reason why alternative data is taking off is just the volume. Um, it's everywhere. So we, we, we have a huge amount of data coming off of vehicles, coming out of our smartphones, off of watches, um, off of satellites, off of drones, planes, you name it. We're now wiring it into an Internet of Things, and we're, and we're capturing through sensors the data. Um, we can also access that data much easier through a variety of subscriptions and APIs. 
And, and so that volume and the easy access, and not to mention the fact that there's a wide diversity of different types of data sets, um, have really expanded our, our notion of what's possible. Um, in addition to the higher notion of what's possible, we obviously have incredible computing power today. Um, you know, with, with uh, you know, the Amazon Web Services and, and their competitors out there delivering us on-demand processing power without having to build server farms of our own, you know, we can do things to the data that we just couldn't do before. And so that processing capability is, is incredible and it's cheaper. And so you can really, you know, go out and find incredibly large data sets and do things with them that you might just never have been able to do. And then there's a few other reasons why it's taking off. But I think the, the interesting thing from my perspective is, is, the, is the problem here, which is many people in the world today view um, alternative data as just simply untapped alpha. So it, it's becoming a mainstream concept to have alternative data, to pay for alternative data, but the core value proposition that we see, especially among the hedge funds that have normalized this practice of using alternative data, is to seek alpha. And in my mind, and, and as th came through the research that we did, which I'll explain in a moment, this kind of leads to an arms race um, of, of data acquisition and, and focusing on using data in shorter and shorter time periods, which ultimately changes the types of data you're acquiring. Um, we're seeing, the, because of the, the factors I mentioned in that previous slide, you know, uh, the possibilities, the processing power, are just lowering the excludability and uh, increasing the rivalry, which means you just have a lot more people participating in the alternative data space and, and seeking to use it to generate alpha. And so if we're all trying to acquire the next great data set and we're all competing for it, it's great for the people who own those data sets or are cultivating that data. But for those of us that are spending millions of dollars on alternative data, it kind of pushes us into a weird escalating arms race um, where we are pushing ourselves increasingly to use that data quickly and, and use speed and short-termism as a vehicle to, to justify the cost of the data set and generate alpha. So the shelf lives for most of these data sets are, are decreasing. And that's problematic for me because most of the work I'm doing is trying to extend the time horizon of long-term investors, help them live up to that moniker, as I said, as it's kicking off. Um, and instead, what we feel like we may be getting with this arms race around alternative data is this unavoidable escalation of behavior, um, which is kind of creating um, odd incentives inside investment organizations. Um, we are, we're hoarding data. We are... Um, we're, we're buying data and then seeking to move quickly. So not only do we, you know, get and, and lock up any data we have, which is a problem because we should be sharing our insights and our knowledge to build more of it. Instead, we are locking our data in black boxes and our insights in black boxes. And once we have that data and we feel like we have something to do with it, we are biased in the way we utilize it. We want to act quickly. So if you've spent $5 million cultivating data, you want to you see an opportunity that you think could return $5 million bucks and cover your cost, uh, you're going to act quickly. And so you, patience is lost uh, in many cases. Um, you act big uh, in order to kind of justify the high cost of getting some of this data and building the resources. And uh, oftentimes you're building an automated um, trading system. So it's, it's not enough just to have the alternative data as an input into investment decision-making. Often this alternative data is then baked directly into an investment process. Um, and so this is creating this weird world that kind of runs counter to my hope, which is alternative data as a reason to think short-term. Um, and, and that's a problem because as long-term investors, we should be playing to our own advantages and uh, our advantage as a pension fund, as a sovereign fund, is almost never speed, okay? So the, to, to do these kinds of things and be fast, you need uh, incredibly expensive in, infrastructure. You've got high risk of capital loss. You have to be agile. Um, and it, it kind of runs counter to the DNA of many of these pension funds and sovereign funds that I work with. And instead, uh, our kind of initial assumption in launching this project 
was that there had to be a role for all of this alternative data um, in in the long term investor community, and and more specifically that there was a strategy that relied on patients, and um, and that still could use alternative data as a as a means of improving outcomes, but one that didn't force a pension fund to trade on an hourly basis, you know, drawing on traffic patterns or or you know consumer data on a, on the telephone. So we did a research project. Um, we've actually done uh, quite a fit, bit more research since this. Uh, since this February 2018 survey instrument we did. Um, we host uh, an annual meeting at Stanford where we bring 30 large pensions and sovereign funds um, just to talk about operations and technology. It's a three-day event. And, uh, and we've been spending probably a day at each of them on, on different types of alternative data. But it kind of um, kicked off uh, with this February 2018 survey where we went and we talked to the 22 senior decision makers at leading institutions. And then based on that survey, we went and we talked in depth with seven more uh, respondents and organizations to understand what they were doing in the space of alternative data. And without giving you like the, the insanely long-winded story of what we did and what we found, here, some of the basic insights that emerged was that among the pensions and sovereigns and endowments and foundations, there is this pervasive belief that alternative data can be used to improve um, net returns, but almost all of the organizations are not ready. So there's, on the one hand, a desire and a belief that this is the future, and on the other hand, a recognition that the infrastructure and the organizational and the dexterity required to do it is not in place. Um, moreover, few, and I think only two, had any formalized strategy um, regarding alternative data. Um, and so, that implies that, you know, we just really don't even have a plan to get the infrastructure in place yet. So we don't have the infrastructure in place, but we don't even have a plan. Many were worried about the cost. Many were worried about a bunch of stuff. But um, ultimately, uh, everybody still viewed this, this rising space of alternative data as a pathway to success. And so we dug in over the next year. And we were trying to identify areas that um, long-term investors could engage in the alternative space and be successful. Uh, we focused on some of these organizations that had um, policies in place, and we focused on some of the organizations that had um, beginnings of alternative data plans and policies. And then we also looked at other industries and uh, and other investors, investor types, to understand how they were using alternative data. Uh, and we came up with kind of two concepts, defensive strategies, so when we think about risk management and, and capital preservation, due diligence, and then defensible strategies where you had access to the data sets and, uh, and you could kind of exclude others from having them. Um, in terms of the first one, and I'll run through these quickly and I'll be happy to take questions. Um, you know, I know I only have a few minutes left. But um, risk management is, is kind of in, the, the obvious one. So using alternative data sets in order to understand uh, the assets that you own or understand the, the environment around you. The thing about financial crises is they often don't repeat in ways that you expect. And so having a richer and uh, broader set of signals can help you understand when a crisis is coming, even if you've never seen it before. And the example we use is kind of a, a tsunami coming at a, an island. Um, and, and so the, the fact that water is receding out kind of encourages the, the locals to take to the hills. Um, the next one is smarter beta. So we're seeing a bunch of companies come in and try to build indices around uh, alternative data sets. Uh, some are launching as indices and you can invest in them today. Some are kind of, um, uh, products that you can buy, but this notion of using all this alternative data, standardizing it, um, and, and then building products around it is incredibly popular. Um, I think I skipped one. Yes. Creative. There. The creative examples, this is uh, – you know, using satellite imagery to um, look at retail parking lots and track them over time, 
using satellite imagery and pointing at, at, at construction sites in places like China where the data is hard to trust, and then looking at shadows moving over time to make assessments of, um, of where those construction sites are really moving quickly and where they're not. They use satellite imagery today to point at the tops of oil drums. The tops of those oil drums often move up and down with the amount of uh, oil in the drum, and so you can look at the shadows on the oil drum and make an assessment of how full those oil drums are, which then leads you to be able to make a prediction of the stock of oil in the world well ahead of any reporting by governments. And I could go on. There's countless examples that are being brought in today and, and kind of sold and, and positioned for investors. Um, in my mind, one of the exciting things is operating alpha, so not just thinking about the alternative data as coming off a of satellite, but coming off of your own organization, uh, looking at the fees and costs, um, looking at the uh, processes and building data sets out of your own organizations in order to improve the operations and generate alpha um, through smart collection of your own data sets and using them to change the way you invest. Um, internal alternative data, this is the holy grail in a way. This is all about um, understanding who your stakeholders are. And let's say you're a pension plan with two and a half million um, pensioners and, and savers, and you have access to their accounts, and you can see when they're pulling money out, putting money in, what they're investing in. And in some cases, you can even see what they're spending money on. Um, there are serious uh, moral and ethical questions to be resolved, but you can imagine if you have two and a half million people out in the world and you can see what they're spending money on and what they're doing with their capital, you can make pretty remarkable predictions about global markets. You can make predictions about real estate prices. You can make all kinds of things. And, and so we're seeing some pension funds, and I won't name them, but we, I can think of one right now, which has established a governance committee around alternative data to explore the ethics of using that kind of information in an investment strategy. And, you know, some people on the, on the call here are probably thinking to themselves, um, that's unethical to utilize that individual data to go and create a, an investment return or an investment strategy. And then there may be other people in the call who are saying it's unethical not to. It's their fiduciary duty to maximize investment returns and use all of the resources they have available to do so. And if they have data that allows them to make predictions about, you know, key asset prices, um, they should be using it. And so these are some of the questions that I know are taking place today uh, about alternative data in, in the context of long-term investors and investment decision-making. And so... We're going to continue this project. This is an interim step. We've written a paper, um, which I'm happy to share with anybody. I'm happy, obviously, to answer any questions. But we're ex extremely excited about the potential of alternative data to simply help with risk management and help long-term investors better understand the things they're investing in and hopefully uh, generate higher returns. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Monica. Thank you, Ashby. Um, super informative and really helpful. And we do have a number of questions that are coming in. Um, I'm going to ask if we can hold in answering those until Quantex um, gives their presentation as well, and, and we'll combine the question and answer session at the end. Um, so I, I do sure. want to turn it to um, to Quantex and to Stephen and Toby if you can uh, kick things off. And, and again, thank you for for joining us. Yeah, hi everyone. So today we're going to speak about applications of big data and AI to ESG and water. So my name is Toby. I'm co-CEO of Quantix. Uh, Monica, you've already introduced me well, so I'm going to detail, but essentially I've previously competed in various engineering competitions. I have a background in finance and I'm a practicing medical doctor. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Steven, co-CEO of Aquantix. I graduated in engineering at the Polytechnique de Montréal, specialized in statistics. I'm also involved in the FinTech and AI ecosystem, participating in talks, competitions, and forums. So, Aquantex is a startup founded in 2017, mainly to solve a problem posed by a large Canadian institutional investor, a problem that they weren't able to solve using conventional finance. 
We're specialized in artificial intelligence, but more precisely in the data generation part. Yeah, essentially this involves generating data to solve complex issues where straightforward good data isn't available. From our perspective, AI is fundamentally changing the relationship between investors and corporations. The main reason we're seeing this is that AI is drastically increasing the transparency of corporations. Let me explain. Whether or not corporations disclose more through AI and alternative data, investors are going to have a much better understanding of the operations, the supply chain, the physical risks, and of local financial situations of corporations. And this is a game changer in the field of ESG. It gives the opportunity to investors as the stakeholders to be more engaged, more demanding of corporations, and to hold them to a higher standard. Corporations will be more accountable for their actions. At this time, the field we've identified as being the most ripe for disruption is that of water. The main reason for this is that in the next few years, water will put trillions of dollars of assets at risk. And right now, water is managed completely inefficiently from a financial perspective. Therefore, we are building the world's largest database on water. We want to be able to track and quantify water the same way one can do with oil or other resources. All this to help our partners in their decision-making process. Now, to do this, there are four main steps involved. We'll go through these steps in more detail throughout the presentation, but essentially, the first step is collecting scattered data. This involves using data science, online scrapers, and other AI techniques to bring various alternative, seemingly unrelated sources together to create a unique database. And the second step is mapping supply, users, and locations. And that is to say, how much water is available, where, who is using it, and how much. The third step is data generation. This step is using AI to generate undisclosed or unmeasured data. And the fourth one is overlaying climate models and simulation. In this step, we automate pre-existing models to generate custom insights. Now for this step. When we go uh, and do data engineering, we start by gathering data, usually from few databases, some PDFs, and a good number of Excel files. When we targeted the water domain, we saw that data was extremely scattered. The number of sources of data is just incredible. There are lots of countries and municipalities sharing information on water use, companies around the world disclosing parts of information, tons of detailed research on water cycles and its impact, plus multiple private and public disclosure efforts. Finally, there is another world of data in the deep web with unclassified and archived data. With all these different sources of data, it becomes incredibly difficult to extract valuable insights. This is because the structure of every data set is different and because the variables and units used are not uniform. So we create a database, merging hundreds of sources together by creating a relational structure of attributes where we're able to aggregate terabytes of data. In this image, you can see a few examples of well-known sources of water data where we've merged parts of them together. So on the technology side, we started the data aggregation with online crawlers, mainly to match primary key identifiers to the different sources of data. In other words, is to create an equivalent table between multiple data sets. Next, we use SQL and entity relation models to create the structure of the database. And finally, we completed the data with some natural language processing to merge web pages, sustainability reports, and a few more corporate files. By converting PDF files to text files, then finding keywords and phrases, and structure to find the specific data like corporate water policy. So once we create a good database, the next step is to georeference the data. So routers are the key here. When a discrete data are modeled, a uh, distance between two points as little of as 10 meters can result in a drastic value variation. For example, going from a flood probability of 40% to zero. 
Rasters allow to transform discrete data into a series of continued data sets. It helps achieving higher precision with lower variability. As an example of georeferencing data, uh, well, an, an example of georeferencing data is mapping corp lo corporate locations. This is necessary because corporations around the world are massive water users, and they're also responsible for changing and often destroying the quality of water. The challenge with mapping corporate locations is that corporations don't disclose location-specific data. They'll comment about some issues and risk-specific locations, but they won't disclose clearly where they operate and what they do in what location. Unless one reads through company websites and investors' relations presentation. But even then, the picture we'll get will be far from complete. But by aggregating alternative data, we're able to pinpoint corporate locations, identify their operations at each site, the size of their operations there, and other site-specific financials. Continuing on the same example of mapping corporate location data, we're able to do this at varying levels of precision for every single publicly traded company across the globe. So we're doing this for 40,000 companies. Here on the left, you can see a list of a few oil companies with their number of locations. As you can see, each of these corporations has lots of locations, some being almost insignificant and some being crucial to their operations. An example of identified locations is shown on the right with the different North American locations of the Canadian oil company named Suncor. We can do this for corporations in every country, no matter where their headquarters are across the globe. The level of detail about operations and assets is more limited, though, in certain countries. So now for the question on how we do this. The main way is by using conventional neural networks and satellite imagery. Yeah. Efficient convolutional neural networks have been one of the big breakthroughs uh, that have made AI so powerful in the last few years. They're essentially interconnected nodes that work like a biological brain's neurological process, where certain links between the neurons get stronger depending on how correlated they are with what they're analyzing. So basically, like humans, you can show the neural network different example of almost whatever you're looking for. And then it will learn to identify those things. For example, if I show many pictures of people with different facial expressions, the neural network will learn to tell me what someone's facial expression is. Using these, it's possible to automatically extract all sorts of information from satellite images. The key, though, is to then combine this data with data from different sources to get a better prediction of the size of the operations and of other corporate location-specific financials. So our third step is the data generation. This part is crucial because many of the data points we're interested in are only partially disclosed, and often they're not even measured. Mm -hmm. This is a step that would be impossible with traditional statistics. But with machine learning and modern computing power, we're able to analyze thousands of columns of data to build, uh, to build, to build models that predict the variables we're looking for. Sorry. A few examples of this, in the case of water, is predicting how much water corporations use, how much water waste they produce, and the quantity of pollutants they release. So now let's go to a toy example to give you an idea of a common machine learning approach to predict simple outcomes on large quantities of data. It's called random forest learning. It's a supervised learning technique useful for classification and regression tasks. The essence of this is to simulate multiple scenarios and calculate the relation of every attribute to the variable we're looking to predict. In this toy example, you want to generate the data telling us whether John is going to play golf or not. Like in most real-life cases, we have historical data attributes, weather, humidity, wind, which all relate to dependent variables, which in this case, is John going to play golf or not? If you look at this table, in the last row, we have an incomplete set of data with raining weather, high humidity, and weak wind, but we don't know if John will play golf, so we want to predict this. Well, let's start with one attribute, the weather. There's three options here, sunny, overcast, and rain. And when we look back at our table, we see that when weather is overcast, 
John does always play golf. It's what we call a pure set. All historical data shows that he will play when it's overcast. We then look at other options. When it's sunny, we are not sure if we'll play or not because it's only in 40% of historical scenarios that he does. When it's sunny, we need more information. Where we do this is to go deeper with another attribute, in this case, humidity. Exactly. And now, when it's sunny, but we also consider the humidity, we find two pure sets, meaning we know historically whether John is going to play or not. And the same is applicable for the wind attribute, when it's raining. We now have a complete tree. In machine learning, we need to do this millions of different times. We need to do tons of iteration to perfect the model. Because we work with very large data sets, with countless rows and columns, one large tree would be statistically insignificant. Therefore, the algorithm selects random samples of rows and random samples of columns, which are named tuples and attributes. For each sample, we create a tree and calculate the probability of John playing in the image to its Y, Z, A, and B. Then, the algorithm selects a new sample of tuples and attributes and repeats the process. And the final result is a precise prediction of John playing as a function of specific attributes. And we use a type of approach to generate data based on thousands of attributes from our database. The difference is we do this with continuous variables, not categorical or discrete, or discrete variables, meaning we use numerical quantities and inputs and generate other numerical quantities. We test the precision of our algorithms by training them on, on certain data sets and then testing them on other data sets. Yeah, and we are continuously improving our algorithm, like adding gradient boosting, for example, to generate even more precise data. Okay, next step. So by now we've collected scared data from various sources using data science, online scraper, and other AI techniques. We've then mapped out all this data to different locations and detailed the different user organization making up the water supply chain. And after that, we generated the missing data to get a complete picture of whatever it is we're looking at. So the final step. The final step is overlaying all these locations and asset-specific data we've collected with climate and weather data models. Fortunately for us, climate and weather data models are highly available and easy to get access to, as they're widely used in the scientific community. This step enables us to estimate future risks and pressures on assets and organizations. Here's a breakdown of some of the water-related risks we've tackled in the past. I'll go through these quickly. So one of them is water pricing regulation. Another one will be water scarcity. Another could be flood risk, then contamination and legal action risks, and brand risks. So we've explained how we work at Quantix, how we build our database. But by now you might be wondering, how is this useful? Or you might have all sorts of ideas as to how this kind of data could be useful. In any case, here are a few ways it could potentially be used. So first of all, it can easily be used to make corporate ESG water reports. It could also be used to make water databases and this is, and some benchmarks. It might be used as a trading information based on physical asset risk. And the data could be customized to be used for investment in agriculture, various commodities, or for supply chain analysis. Good, so if you have any questions, um, or if you have any interesting idea, other ideas for our data, or you'd be interested in working on projects with us, please write to us. Stephen and I's personal emails are right here. And our slides are also available on our website. So thank you all for listening. We hope this was interesting to you, and we will be happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen and Toby. Uh, so please do let us know if you have questions uh, for either Steve, Stephen, Toby, um, or Ashby um, presenting who presented first. Um, we have the chat box on the left. Please type your questions in there. Um, there are a few questions that have come in. Um, so the first, and this could be for um, any of the speakers, is really around um, 
you know, the the old saying about data, garbage in, garbage out. Um, you know, what are, you know, how can you ensure the quality of the data is, is good? Or, you know, what are the key things to look for? And then, you know, also in terms of how can investor really test if it, the, the data can be material and, and really useful in decision making, specifically invest, investment decision making. Um, so if uh, anyone wants to leap in on that one, uh, please do. Yeah, sure. So I, I can take a go ahead and talk about the huge problem we tackle. Please do. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> That's good. All right. So this is a good problem that we have to tackle. Um, it's one of the big parts of aggregating data is to do the data science, to merge all the data together and to clean it. And the good, a good thing we think we do to take some good input data is that we generate tons of it. And then we can base our model on it to get some great insights. It's like uh, Dr. Monk previously mentioned in his presentation. Um, the most challenging part is not necessarily applicate using AI models. It's rather the whole data aggregation part and data set building part. For us, that's the most challenging and the most difficult part. After that, simply applying algorithms in this data is, is much simpler. So that, that exact part about how do you aggregate the data, make a good database, is the core of what we do. I'm going to aggregate a couple aggregate. questions. Oh. oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ashby. Please do uh, go on. I'm sorry. I, didn't, I think there's a delay, so I'm sorry about the uh, talking over you. Um, look, I think part of what I think is interesting about that question is it allows us to remind people that there is this interplay that's emerging that is AI plus alternative data. Um, you know, the the satellite images coming from satellites down to Earth aren't, aren't perfect, and they require artificial intelligence to render them useful. And so uh, there's some really interesting applications of artificial intelligence just to create the alternative data and ensure that we have integrity. Um, there's also you know, a bunch of questions that we can talk about here, which is uh, the provenance of the data, uh, you know, where it's come from, the the scope of the data, you know, how big is the data set, how big of a population does it represent for the question you're asking, how old is the data. Um, there's a whole set of characteristics of data that we talk about in our paper that are critical for understanding its value and specific value to an investor and a strategy. Most of the work that we're doing today, uh, at least at Stanford, is around how do we assess that value and then how do we integrate the data sets into investment decision making, which implies um, figuring out whether or not it's garbage and, or whether or not it's valuable. Thank you, Ashby. And uh, if I, you know, we do send uh, a reminder and, and a 